Uh, today we have uh, Professor Manjari Karcho of um, Hyderabad Central University who is going to talk about refereeing electoral competition in India, the role of the Election Commission in India's democracy. Uh, obviously it's very uh, relevant and topical given that the elections are going to be announced any day soon, the general elections which should be held in April, May. Um, Manjari is, as I said, a professor of uh, politics at the Department of Political Science at Hyderabad Central University. She has been in the department in 2000, so almost a quarter of a century. Um, it's a bit late, but happy to have you here uh, in Manthan. Uh, Manjari they got her PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies in the late 90s. Um, and then after that, as I said, she's been at HCU. She is the author of um, three books, all um, dealing with contemporary politics in a sense. The first was um, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad and Indian Politics, published in 2003 by Orrin Longman. The second was Hinduizing Democracy, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad in Contemporary India, published in 2017. And the latest book published uh, last year, which would be which she would be drawing on for her talk today, is titled Electoral practice and the Election Commission of India, Politics, Institution and Democracy. Uh, I'm sure we will have many interesting things to hear from Manjari and then a discussion thereafter. Manjari. Yeah. It's an honor to be on the Manthan platform where um, several eminent speakers have come and uh, you know, uh, spoken about their work, uh, uh, their activities. Uh, so here, I'm, um, as Ram said, I'm going to speak on the Election Commission of India and I'm going to basically talk about uh, its activities and also what the Election Commission is and what, it, what does it do, what does it take to make an election. So, uh, as Ram said again, it's a very topical issue and topical because of several reasons. Uh, uh, the first reason is that you know, the electoral bonds, uh, you know, the, the verdict on the electoral, electoral bonds came uh, by the Supreme Court and Supreme Court said that it's unconstitutional, it has to be taken away. It was a scheme which was introduced in 2017. Then we also have uh, the whole debate which is going on about the one nation, one election issue. And uh, what we hear is that the government is quite keen on it and, uh, you know, excerpts from uh, the committee's proceedings uh, which have come out uh, in, the, in the news have, have been reported. Uh, it seems that the government is quite keen. It wants to take the whole project forward. In fact, I was looking at the terms of reference of the high-level committee uh, chaired by Professor, uh, sorry, chaired by uh, former President uh, Covind and uh, one could make out uh, from the terms of reference that uh, it, it's something which is set. The idea is there and it seems that the government wants to go ahead on it, uh, but it wants to uh, just see, just test the waters. It also wants to see how, uh, what sort of constitutional amendments would be needed. In fact, it will be a major constitutional overall because, because this is a major constitutional uh, issue. And uh, what we hear is that uh, another section, which is about, you know, which, which might be called Part 15A, might be introduced in the Constitution. Part 15 deals with the elections and the activities, responsibilities of the Election Commission. But the government might introduce another uh, part to the Constitution, which uh, would be talking about the simultaneity of uh, elections. All elections going to be held at the same time. And since I'm speaking about this, I should, uh, you know, let you know that, uh, you know, arguments have come from both the sides and the government had looked for suggestions as well. And we were told that, I mean, it, it was reported that uh, about 21,000 responses were received from the public. And what was also uh, said by the committee, by the government sources, uh, in fact it was I think the Law Commission, which said that 81% of the public is in favor of this uh, simultaneity uh, you know, of elections, uh, elections being synchronized at all the levels, the national elections, the state elections, and the municipal elections. So we have no way of verifying. 
and in the terms of reference it was also said it was you know the the committee uh, was asked to examine and ask the election commission that what all will we need what would be the logistics of having uh, simultaneous elections um, so election commission would also have to sort of in fact if it's about elections of course elections uh, election commission uh, would be there it has to it, it is the body which, is ha which has to arrange the elections. And they're saying that, you know, about 30 lakh uh, units would be required, the EVMs. And uh, as of now, in this election, the election commission is not in a position to provide uh, that. Uh, also, what, is, what was in the news a few uh, weeks ago, and which makes this quite relevant, was the Chandigarh mayoral poll, where the, po the ballot papers were defaced by the presiding officer himself, the returning officer. And then the uh, Supreme Court had to move in and say that this is something which is unacceptable. It, it, it was, uh, you know, set aside, and all of us know what happened. So, uh, you know, all these activities, all these issues, all these verdicts, and also the fact that now the general elections are around the corner, and, um, and it, it, it's, it's, you know, like it's something we should know, but that, you know, like it's not something which can be done overnight. There are 4,500 assembly constituencies, and which become constituencies for elections which are there which are going to be held in different states and about 543 Lok Sabha constituencies. So, you know, why, uh, you know, what about, what, what kind of a body is the EC? What kind of a institution uh, is the election commission? So, uh, beginning from the very, uh, you know, uh, from the very starting point, uh, one should, in fact, this is something which comes into, uh, uh, you know, come to the comes to the forefront every now and then. That the election commission is a constitutional institution. It's not a statutory body. It was a body which was established by the constitution. And very interestingly, it sort of it's a non-elected uh, institution, but handling a democratic exercise which is vast, which is it's sort of it's it is a state institution, it's a formal institution, it's a constitutional institution, but it handles an exercise which is democratic. So if you see it, you know, if you if you just contrast this, it itself is not a democratic body. It's a nominated body, but it handles the uh, uh, democratic exercise which involves everybody. And also going back a little, uh, you know, uh, further into history, uh, studies were conducted in the 1990s and also in the later deca decade of the 2000s and it was found that the EC, the election commission was the most trusted institution of all the state institutions in India. That was followed by the judiciary, then came the, the, the state governments, then the you know, you know, uh, municipal governments, etc. But the last to come were the, uh, was the bureaucracy. So it was the most trusted institution way back in the 1990s and 2000s. But now we see that, you know, no such survey has been conducted, but, you know, I, you know, I would be really curious. I'm really curious to know what will be its standing now, because it's, it's come to be seen as a weak need institution. It has become pliant. Uh, it's always soft on the ruling party. So, you know, from the 1990s when it was very trusted, people trusted it, whether it was from the, you know, the opinion of the middle classes or the mass of the population, it was an institution which people trusted. That this is an institution which can do no wrong. We are the ones who are voting, we are coming and, you know, we are exercising our uh, democratic rights. And this is the institution which is going to respect that. And it has respected that. But off late, all of us know what sort of allegations have come against the EC, and, and I'll take, take that up later. And, you know, in this context, what we also see is that it's not that today it's the, the, the election commission is being attacked or it's being criticized by different political parties, opposition parties. It has happened from the very beginning. It has happened from the very beginning. But, uh, uh, so what, what, has happened now is uh, that criticism uh, is uh, the, the criticisms are much much more the attacks are much much more but it has to be realized that when the 
election commission is being criticized and attacked by different ruling parties it is doing its job well so that's something which we have to keep in mind when you know the ruling parties feel very happy with the work of the election commission we should immediately sort of think about it as a you know as something which is not not right so the attacks and criticisms which come mainly from the ruling parties um, tell us that it's doing its job well and this is the way it should do its job so once those criticisms stop we should you know uh, we should sort of you know our tentacles up and we'll say that there's not there's something which is not correct there uh, another thing about the uh, the history of the election commission uh, when the constituent assembly debates were going on and the constitution was being thrashed was being made there were two options before uh, the constituent assembly one was to have a uh, centralized one election commission just one institution and the other option was that we have st you know in every state we have an election commission so there were these two options but none other than dr ambedkar said that we have to have a centralized institution because uh, the discrimination the social injustices which were there at, at the state level those will get furthered those discrimination discriminations will get entrenched so that's why it's better to have one centralized ec which works in a coordinated manner it takes an integrated approach and if there's any issue of discrimination or or uh, you know um, sort of deliberate disenfranchisement then it can be taken care of so the the it, the decision was taken right back in the you know late 40s uh, when the constituent assembly uh, was debating the constitution uh, thrashing out the constitution that uh, the election commission should be a single unified body and not sort of dispersed and having branches uh, everywhere Uh, the other point which comes up and which, where you know why my my title is such you know um, election commission refereeing electoral competition and elec election commission and democracy because it's it's a part of uh, it's it's a certain way of uh, approaching democracy and i've approached in it in the procedural way democracy uh, democracy can be seen as a substantive project and as a procedural uh, work a procedural activity Susta substantive means that there are issues of rights there are issues of entitlements uh, you know rights of the uh, of people on the margins uh, individual rights rights to dissent so these form the substantive part of democracy but the other part other way of looking at democracy is the procedural way that the correct procedures have to be followed procedures have to be uniform procedures shouldn't discriminate between um, you know people or between sections or between individuals and uh, uh, whatever it is procedures should be universally applicable and non discriminatory so and and of course here the elections elections are procedures the electoral procedure the way we uh, discuss about it or uh, describe it so i am handling when i talk about the election commission i have focused on the procedural uh, part of democracy that is elections and election the election commission handles that part of democracy that the procedures have to be correct they have to be uniform they shouldn't discriminate they should be universally applicable to um, everybody and today we see that the substantive part of democracy is is being attacked is it's under you know sort of lot of pressure <coughs> rights of people the right to dissent so that is something which is on a very sticky wicket today the way we are the way politics in india is go, uh, going uh, the procedural side is fine but the procedural side also we should see as citizens as conscientious citizen that that doesn't become weak uh, and it sort of provides a foundation to uh, the substantive part of democracy so what i argue is what i have argued uh, i mean in my research on the election commission and i think that for this particular evening um, uh, you know th this is something which i have to uh, sort of also talk about is that uh, usually when we talk about procedural democracy the election commission or the elections or the whole electoral process uh, we say that it's it's uh, the people and the politics the social side of uh, the procedural democracy which is important here i say that it's that side is important 
the social side is 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 something which has to be considered it feeds into the procedures correct procedures democratic procedures but institutions formal institutions are also important if we have to take uh, the demo uh, democratic project forward and you know with by talking about the election commission uh, this is something which i also foreground that a look at institutions is very important and we need to study them we need to take them seriously and we need to see uh, what sort of role they are playing in taking the democratic project um, forward but if if that's the case and when we are talking about democracy and when we are talking about elections and making the whole ele electoral exercise a uh, success it's not only the election commission election commission is is helped by is supplement its efforts are supplemented by a number of other institutions and agencies so the other constitutional institutions like the supreme court the entire judiciary the parliament uh you know uh, the political parties then the civil society the citizen voter uh the media they all get together to make a successful election and we also as as you know as citizens as i said citizen voter we also have a role to play uh, you know to see to it that the democratic project runs smoothly democracy is not sort of violated the rights of people are not violated and even the procedures uh, are carried on properly uh, uniformly so you know if uh, that's the case again when we look at ec's work the election commission's work uh, it's it's it, again it's not something which is you know which is a you know which is just carry because it is a con constitutional duty it's carrying on its work which it has to do like a you know a, like a benign machinery uh, what i argue is uh, that it is engaged in uh, processes like modernization it makes us think like a citizen voter than a subject of you know than a colonial subject or a subject of some sort of a political rule or a, the political regime that we are participants we are citizens we have to uh, think about things in an informed way so election commission is, you know lays down the process for us of elections of polling and it makes us think it makes us conscious as a citizen and that i think is quite important at least for me it's important uh, and with this is attached the whole um, uh, task of politicization you know modernization making us think like a citizen it goes um, along with uh, the politicization of uh, the citizen that you know we have to participate it's not just that you know you be in 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 drawing room conversations we discuss politics but we have to come out you know at the age of 18 years we become we have the right we become eligible to vote so uh, the whole process of politicization that as the age of 18 which was early 21 when we come out to vote we are also thinking about ourselves as participatory uh, individuals as participatory uh, people who are participating in politics and this is at the lowest level of public participation then we go on, you know a higher level of participation would be you know canvassing for a political party or contesting elections but if the election commission and the administration which works with it which works um, under its supervision uh, makes us think as uh, political beings as people who are politically conscious it raises that uh, political consciousness in us and this is the actualization of citizenship that we are thinking about ourselves as citizens as a collective being as a collective entity that as individuals we vote but it's an individual vote but the activity its its impact happens uh because it brings us all together in a collective exercise collective democratic exercise so one individual vote which is uh, which becomes possible because of the election commission uh and the impact is tremendous the impact is collective it makes us think like uh, like one integrated uh, whole uh, you know the citizen body you know like we can call it the nation we can call it a, a democratic community we can call it the political community and that's for how we start thinking when we just go out uh, using the facilities which the electoral administration has uh, provided to us and we go there go into the polling booth and think of ourselves as uh, you know as uh, uh, 
citizens as political uh, you know political political citizens as as people who have to participate in uh, the political activity so if we just look at the uh, you know uh, at look at the in, uh, india's electorate uh, the india's electorate has grown more than five times in 1942 uh, sorry in 1952 it was 17.32 crores and now it has become 91.2 crores so these are the eligible voters uh, in 2019 91.2 crores were eligible to vote and if you look at the size one can just say that the size itself makes uh, makes the country the largest democracy in the world so about 9 that's 91 uh, 91.2 crore means 900 million and they were eligible to vote in 2019 and the election commission regulates this competition of elections um, and as i said oversees the involvement of all and accomplishes an important facet of citizenship and the small act of voting uh, becomes a colossal act for sustaining democracy and taking democracy uh, forward so now what i want to focus on is uh, you know what makes an election uh, what makes for a smooth conduct of the electoral exercise because an election takes a huge amount of resources it takes equipment it takes you know technology it takes you know heavy infrastructure number of personnel and that's why in, in many studies which were conducted in um, especially the african continent it was said that many african countries they want to have elections they want to have regular elections but they don't have the resources for it because an election takes a huge amount of uh, money huge amount of uh, uh, resources the infrastructure has to be there properly uh, planned number of personnel have to be involved in conducting an election so it's just not that we want to be a democracy and then you know it it takes elections take a huge amount of money and it's not i'm just not only talking about the the money which political parties spend but the whole electoral administration rests on a very smooth flow of a smooth flow and availability of resources that all this has to be handled by the election commission and i'll come to the numbers i mean just looking at the sheer numbers which i'm going to now because i don't re remember i'm just going to read these out uh, just just see the enormity uh, from uh, 10.5 crores this is rupees in 1951 uh, the cost of organizing a lok sabha election uh, went up to 3870 crores so it's more than 300 times but then you can count the question me that we have to account for inflation the price rise etc etc and obviously it will grow uh, that big but you just see you know how uh, the election the, the money has grown the amount which has to be spent has grown between 2009 and uh, 2014 lok sabha elections the cost more than tripled from rupees 1114 crores to 3870 crores so you can make out that the electoral administration you know it's a huge exercise uh, money has to be spent uh, infrastructure has to be provided uh, personnel have to be engaged uh, you know vehicles have to be engaged uh, posters banners you know so many things uh, have to be chairs desks everything so this includes ev you know all uh, the, the, the you know all uh, which which uh, the costs of an election uh, just one lok sabha uh, sort of election sort of cost so much and then uh, also what about the staff i was told that 11 million strong staff is there which conducts one Lok Sabha election which means a population of Hyderabad today's population of Hyderabad or even of the population of London about 10 to 11 uh, million strong then the personal work for 180 to 365 days in advance to prepare for an election it's not that it happens in two months or three months so they work backwards uh, uh, you know more or less now they know when the elections are going to be held they work backwards on the dates and it takes about six months to an year to prepare for an election uh, very elaborate calendars of over 100 election activities are prepared and continuously monitored by the election commission 
so uh, 100 election activities and also the scheduling of elections scheduling of elections is again a challenging task looking at the diversity um, of climate and culture and i'll come to that so um, <clears throat> Of course, then the whole cost of EVMs, the technology, and I'm, I'm going to deal with EVMs later, but just to tell you that EVMs, uh, you know, if there's any problem, there's any malfunctioning, transportation of EVMs, that again costs a lot. And they say that the lifespan of an EVM is 15 years. So after about three election cycles, the EVMs also have to be changed and the testing and transporting and putting them into strong rooms and guarding them, that itself is a huge exercise. So, you know, uh, while on one hand, I mean, why I'm, I'm saying all this, you know, while on one hand we say that, and that's right, that, you know, that, that it's, it's, a, it's a body which has to sort of conduct elections and it has to do its work impartially and it has to be seen as an impartial body. But on the other hand, it's also, you know, rather than just sort of simply saying that it's something, you know, like which has become pliant and all, we also have to see the enormity of the, task it handles and that's something which the, the, the balance has to be there and I'm not saying it's not that I'm, I'm sort of holding a brief for the election commission but I'm saying that you know such a complex task enormous activity so the election commission has to do it but also it has to do it in a way where it, it does it impartially and also is seen as an impartial body is seen as a neutral body which won't be client to the executive or the regime which is which is ruling so coming back to the scheduling of elections uh, the, el the election schedule has to take into account the pre monsoon showers uh, in april may it has to take into account the acute summer heat but it has to hold elections now because this is the you know like after the exams the time is there and schools are on holidays uh, region specific and location specific security challenges are there areas which are relatively more sensitive they have to be handled with special care uh, you, um, you know sometimes more more security is needed sometimes more time is needed that you know the polling booth is in a remote area so you have to have more time so that the machines the personnel all the paper uh, you know everything the paper the chairs and desks reach on time and they they are, they are prepared on time then also religious occasions and public holidays have to be taken into account. School annual examinations and entrance tests for professional courses. Agricultural cycles like planting and harvesting. So when the election calendar is prepared, I was told all these have to be taken into account to fix the election and it's not an easy task. It's, you know, like, you know, sometimes it's, you know, now, if we see the national, the general elections, more or less the time is fixed because of certain reasons, but the election commission is at work the whole year round because there's some bipole, some state election, something which has to be held and uh, uh, it has to work all the year round. And uh, all these things have to be taken into account so, the PP, so that people can come out and vote. It's not that, you know, if there's an agricultural cycle, people are busy, the farmers are busy and they cannot the agricultural uh, workers, they cannot come out and vote and the election is fixed at that particular time. So that shouldn't happen. And the phases as well. You know, sometimes it's seen, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, uh, the thing is that how are the phases fixed? The, the, the different phases of elections. Earlier the elections used to happen in just one phase or one or two phases, but now they take about seven phases. And in each phase, all these things have to be taken into account uh, along with the model code of conduct which is in place and the election commission and it's the entire administration has to monitor all the time that the model code of conduct doesn't um, get violated so uh, <clears throat> uh, so in in all this the election commission besides conducting the uh, the elections it enrolls and enfranchises the enrollment is on it it has to do, it has to prepare the electoral roles. And now, in fact, the, it's, it's been a long uh, demand, long standing demand that the electoral role should be single. And this is one of the mandates of the committee on one nation, one election, that the electoral uh, roles, which are two now, uh, you know, there's a, one electoral role for the state assembly, assembly elections and one for the general elections. 
so it's better it's a long demand it's a good demand that they should be fused there should be one electoral role because there's a lot of duplication there's a lot of problem there's a lot of confusion so that falls on the shoulders of the election commission uh, it mediates between competitors it mobilizes also in studies it was shown that it is the young the middle classes and women who are the ones who don't come out and vote especially in urban areas so election commission over the last uh, three or four cycles have has started conducting work of social mobilization also it has gone to colleges it has uh, recruited celebrities uh, sports persons to uh, to just motivate the urban voter to mo motivate women in urban areas in cities to motivate the youth in cities uh, so that they come out uh, and vote so it was said that because of the 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 efforts of the election commission we see a rise in the number of voters coming from cities who um, you know who, who sort of comprise the youth uh, the women and generally the professionals so um, uh, it also has a task which is a very typical task of recognizing registering and uh, giving symbol to symbols to political parties no political party can contest an election unless it has been registered and given a symbol by the election commission so uh, just uh, you know just saying or just you know just registering and uh, you know being there on the rolls doesn't mean that one can contest elections the election commission has to assign a symbol before the party uh, uh, becomes um, eligible for uh, contesting for elections and it's very interesting again going back into history that it was around the 1990s uh, when tn session and all of us know that when tn session became uh, the chief election commissioner that um, you know that the election commission became very assertive and it came out on its own and they say that you know like you know many times it is said that election commission sort of came out as a mature organization in the 1990s and um, under uh, mr tn session and uh, uh, in fact uh, you know uh, earlier you know so happened very rarely but when tn session was on the uh, scene uh, a few elections also were cancelled though there was a lot of pressure that elections have happened they shouldn't get cancelled but they were <coughs> countermanded and re-elections were um, held so you know it's very interesting session was wearing you know he was sort of called names by political parties and different um, uh political leaders so he was referred to as a bull in a china shop a dictatorial super government and as a madman by political leaders for his steadfastness steadfastness towards enforcement of ec instructions uh the former chief minister uh, of tamil nadu late uh, jayalalitha called him an embodiment of arrogance he warded off criticism by claiming to be more popular than amitabh bachchan and an endangered species so there used to be this duels between tn session and uh, the political parties and they say that litigation costs for the election commission rose from rupees 1 lakh in 91 92 to rupees 22 lakhs in 93 94 i mean immediately you know when he comes on the scene that we see that litigations that election commission has taken a decision to contest that political parties have gone to court and litig lit litigation costs have uh, risen <clears throat> so high i mean uh, 22 times uh, he remarked that all institutions including the judiciary had degenerated at which the supreme court warned him to keep his mouth shut so um, his adamant stance over introduction of voters identity card in fact he was the one who introduced the the voters identity card brought him into confrontation with governments at the center and various states he announced in 1993 that he would not hold any election after 1st january 1995 in a state if the voters were not provided with identity cards in fact this became a very big issue that, you know tussle between the election commission at that time and uh, the state governments that you know how elections going to be held elections have to be held because the time is up now the you know the assembly time which is there which was sort of uh, the time of the last the tenure of the last assembly has ended elections have to happen within 6 months and here 
the election commission was saying that elections cannot be held if the voters don't, if the state governments don't issue the voters identity cards. So it became a, hu a huge issue, a huge uproar uh, happened um, in, in various state, uh, states of that time uh, because of the state assembly elections and the adamant stance of the election commission. But what happened with this was that election procedures did get streamlined. Uh, you know, though these, there were these very, very sort of bitter, acerbic uh, exchanges between the election commission and the state governments and uh, the political leaders. So, um, uh, it is reported that the November-December 94 assembly elections, especially in Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka, were most lackluster in recent times. Absent during these elections was a vulgar display of garish posters, cutouts and banners, also absent were the instances of rigging and misuse of government machinery. And it is said that even Prime Minister Narsimha Rao's convoys, uh, uh, convoys consisted of just a handful of cars. So, and EC also took a very tough stand against candidates who did not file their daily expenditure reports. So election officers stated, all along we have heard about free and fair polls now session is making it a reality. In 1995, the state and union ministers were banned from all touring from the date of the announcement of the general election schedule. So what is reported is that it's you know about this time that the election commission sort of comes out, becomes very uh, assertive. Uh, you know, uh, one of the scholars has, has, has called the election commission the activist election commission and it has it becomes activist at this time and session of course uh, some of us know that he he uh, he won the raman magasese award in 1996 uh, for his resolute actions to bring order fairness and integrity to elections in india the world's largest democracy so you know uh, but what i want to foreground here is that this is just the individual what we have to keep, keep in mind is also the, the context of that time. So it was not merely that Session was doing all this. In fact, the context was such that, you know, there was a need that elections should be supervi supervised more firmly. It was a time of the fragmentation of the party system. It was a time of fragmentation of political parties. Many more political parties and independent candidates had uh, come in the fray. Uh, the, the competition was becoming actually very, very um, uh, sort of uh, intense and bitter. So a body, uh, the institution had to come out, had to take steps, had to become activist. So it's, it's, more, it's not so much about the individual, though he got a lot of attention, but it was the context which was important. Uh, India was going through a political churn at that point of time in the 1990s, and we see that regional parties were coming up, and uh, India was actually becoming a multi-party multi -party system in the real sense of the term. That there were so many parties coming up, the competition was becoming so intense that the electoral body, the electoral referee had to act tough and had to take certain measures where the, the procedural side of democracy became much you know, more regulated rather than becoming completely scattered and, you know, uh, be, be becoming a terrain of rule violations and uh, trampling upon uh, democracy itself. So this is something which I, I, which, which, uh, I wanted to particularly shed uh, light on that Session, as I said earlier, Session has been given a lot of attention. He has been sort of, there were really serious tussles between him and the ruling parties of that time. And it was not just him, it was the, the times were such that the institution had to come up, had to become assertive, had to become activist the way, you know, a scholar has called it. But this led to a very interesting situation. Uh, the election commission now, in fact for many years, uh, has been a three-member body, a three-member institution. So the election commission is, uh, you know, now and in fact for the last several election cycles has been a, a three-member commission. But it wasn't so earlier. It was a single-member commission, but and parliament, the constitution uh, rested powers with the parliament that the number can change if 
uh, you know, so required. So it's after the tussle between the ruling parties, the central government and the state governments, uh, uh, and session that there was an attempt by the regime at that point of time that the member, you know, that there should be a depersonalization of the election commission and two more members should be appointed. So this had ha happened earlier also during uh, uh, Rajiv Gandhi's tenureship, then that, you know, that, that incumbent election commissioner at that time and Rajiv Gandhi, the government under Rajiv Gandhi had some uh, issues and there was an attempt and it was, you know, the, the election commission became a three member body, but <coughs> When session came, it had reverted back to becoming a single member commission. But because of session's activities and the bitter tussles, uh, there was again an attempt to make, you know, the, the parliament was sort of uh, activated on this, that it should become a three member commission. And this is again, it, it shows what the context was at that point of time, what the environment, political environment was at that point of time, that the competition again had become so intense that it was, you know, th that the EC itself had to be depersonalized and democratized further. So the ruling regime at that point of time, it was uh, Prime Minister uh, Narsimha Rao, uh, who said that, who, you know, who f government under him felt that it should become a three member uh, committee. Uh, so it was basically the po uh, a political reason. But what happened was a institutional transformation at that point of time and from 1993 onwards, election commission became a three member institution. It was not always a three member institution and the fallout was that session was very upset. And he went to the court, but uh, the, the court decided, the court verdict was that uh, you know, it's fine that it should sort of remain and the central government then passed an ordinance and then it was it was passed as a parliamentary uh, legislation as well. And MS Gill and GVG Krishnamurti came and became the two other election commissioners and the election commission became a three member uh, body. Uh, and when he went to court, of course, uh, his, his plea was thrown out of the window and the uh, Supreme Court went along with uh, the ruling regime that uh, the election commission has to be depersonalized and uh, democratized. So, uh, <clears throat> so you know, th that time and, and, and the time now, and I have to repeat that, you know, that uh, the election commission was strengthened, it was, it became depersonalized, and from then onwards, it sort of became quite active as far as the electoral competition was concerned, but as I said earlier, it's, you know, a successful election is is not only because of the election commission, there are other constitutional institutions involved, and also the civil society, uh, the media, and the voters themselves. So um, the election commission, when it started, uh, you know, uh, when it sort of began this journey of assertiveness, it was also seen that, you know, election violence because of this activeness also came down. You know, the, the, the influence of the, the militias, the influence of the local strongmen on elections in various constituencies was seen that that is also coming, violence is coming down. And this was open violence, not the violence where intimidation is, is, is seen, but open violence. But again, it was something of an achievement from, a, from a, you know, certain, in certain areas, elections being very violent, uh, those areas turning into areas where election violence was more or less controlled and became uh, neutralized. So, um, of course, uh, the mechanization also helped. And, uh, you know, here we have to talk about the EVMs, uh, but I'll come to that later. What I want to sort of bring uh, here again, um, you know, more substantive aspects of an election, which is about the expenditure. And uh, we all know that when an election comes, the, 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 the event of an election means a kind of a um, flow of uh, both, uh, uh, you know, freebies, goodies, liquor, fees, distribution of, uh, you know, uh, cash, 
and uh, it's not that the, uh, the you know that we all know that there there are limits to how much a political party how much a candidate can spend and these limits are always revised every election cycle we have seen that the limits are revised and for a lok sabha election um, you know for a, for a bigger con bigger state the limit is higher and for a smaller state the limit is slightly lower so for the bigger states now <clears throat> for an lok sabha election the limit is about 77 lakhs uh, no it's it's been revised so the last cycle it was 70 lakhs and one of the parties said that 70 lakhs is nothing you know our t bills are of 70 lakhs so um, you know it's it's um, it's so it's not only just you know freebies and goodies uh, cash it has been reported that uh, cash uh, there's a free flow of cash and also there's this assumption about you know, when the cash is distributed that the you know the electoral electorate is easily corruptible and also the assumption is that distribution of cash and freebies is is going to impact winability in the sense that if there's more of cash distribution it is going to lead to our victory but in fact uh, we know our experience in india shows and also studies which have been conducted uh, in other uh, countries in certain countries it has it has been shown that this doesn't always work that uh, if there are freebies distributed if there are there is cash distributed it doesn't necessarily mean that the election is going to uh, be won by the highest bidder what happens is that uh, though it comes with an illegal activity but what has been seen is the electorate is quite happy with it so there's quite a hiatus between how the legal um, authorities view this it is of course an illegal act but how the uh, popular opinion views it the popular opinion the popular feeling about it is quite fine that it's fine that you know we are able to each election we are able to earn we'll able, able to collect this much of money which is coming to us from various political parties and we are not going to vote for the party which has given to the highest amount to us so it has been seen that people already make up their minds they take money from everybody and then they vote for whoever they want to vote for they have decided uh you know beforehand that they are going to vote for this particular party and so you know um uh, in fact i was told that uh you know there was you know th th these these students who told me that uh, you know the people take money in fact it's happened in their experience and they sort of pay off their debts with that money which they have collected and sometimes it you know at that point of time this is i'm talking about some 7 8 years ago they said we once we collected about 30000 rupees somebody collected in their uh, you know vicinity in their neighborhood and that lady was able to pay off all her debts so they said why not if we are able to get something at this po point of time uh, why not why should there be a curb on on this um, but it you know i was talking to one of the election commissioners and this came out um, you know i was reading about it also that it's not uniform the way money uh, sort of is distributed or money is used it's not uniform it happens more in the south and the west more in south indian states and the west it's not a uniform pattern that there's such a free flow of money all over the country so the, of course the, the election commission ropes in the security and financial uh, agencies like the income tax intelligence and financial intelligence units to keep track and to sort of uh, monitor uh, you know video monitoring and other so sort of uh, you know surveillance cameras and all you know if something is you know this this a suspicious movement they uh, uh, they they sort of catch it and you know bring it out and of course uh, punitive action is taken but you know very interesting things come came out during my study that money is carried in different ways once there was a marriage ceremony without the bride and groom so it was just a collection of people where cash and goodies were being distributed and of course that was caught then money is transported in dashboard of cars this is all reported uh, there's alcohol in milk vans uh you know inside pens where you know with the ink pens you roll money and keep and distribute the pens uh sometimes narcotics has been transported in vegetable vans vegetable vehicles 
so uh, you know uh, political parties find innovative ways of carrying and distributing money and this this is what has been um, you know uh, reported it has uh, sort of come out in various news reports and uh, while talking to um, you know officers and officials uh, <clears throat> so it's it's during this the time of elections that the political party uh, the voters and the election commission come in close proximity and uh, as i said earlier the political party cannot contest unless you know it's registered unless a symbol has been given to it and uh, if the political parties the ruling parties keep attacking the election commission it means that the election commission is doing its job so many times the the state parties say that the election commission is a stooge of the central government uh, you know where the appointments in fact happen uh, uh, these are central government appointments uh, so you know but the election commission has also countermanded polls it has caught political parties it has censured political parties in fact um, you know uh, uh, one famous case was that you know this uh, hate speech by varun gandhi in 2009 elections and uh, the election commission sort of count, uh, you know censured that it advised the political party that is the bjp that uh, you know he shouldn't be put up as a candidate but the bjp went ahead with that and later the state government filed an fir against him then uh, other you know there were other leaders other ruling parties there was a railway minister who was distributing cash uh, to women to in fact uh, dalit women and he was uh, sort of caught and reprimanded then also um, uh, there was this famous case where the law minister himself uh, salman khurshid was during up elections when he was promising certain and the moral code of conduct was in was in uh, force uh, he was reprimanded he had to apologize and uh, of course in fact we had this case where uh, chief minister mamta banerjee uh, you know there was this uh, very bitter exchange between the election commission and her during the 2014 uh, general elections where it was felt that certain officials need to be transferred because uh, they might uh, conduct themselves in a biased political way and all these cases you know uh, the election commission then goes becomes you know a, a sort of uh, an entity which has to face a lot of attacks from the political parties then in 2014s 14 Uh, during the lok sabha elections the hate speeches which were uh, you know given by um, now uh, home minister uh, he was in the home minister then amit shah and the election commission reprimanded then yogi adityanath in 2019 elections because of hate speech he was also um, censured and uh, the ec said that he cannot uh, campaign for a certain uh, number of hours same about uh, mayawati uh that the election commission at some point or the other has you know like has sort of gone after these star campaigners the, these big political leaders who have held uh, positions um, and uh, said that you have to put your act together you cannot go ahead like this you have to sort of climb down from uh, you know the activity which is seen as violating the moral code of um, conduct so you know all this is there and of course we have the case of the evms also the evms uh, uh, were brought in and in fact hyderabad is the home of the evms because the the machine is manufactured here and in bangalore uh, the evms were brought to uh, control poll rigging because so many times during election violence the the ballot papers were stamped and uh, they were you know uh, there was poll rigging and the verdict was changed and the local strong men were involved and it was felt that mechanization is is going to help here that evms have to be brought in and from 2000 and evms you know there were there were experiments the evms were used uh, the first time in kerala but that election was countermanded by the supreme court saying that it has to be legalized unless evms are legalized there's a law which is put into place for uh, their use we cannot go ahead with them
So that was done and from the 2004 elections, the EVMs were used for all elections. And it has been seen that whoever is in the opposition comes and sort of criticizes the EVM, says that it is, you know, it is, it's e easy to be uh, tampered, it has been tampered with. So usually what we see is it's from the opposition parties, the criticism comes um, about the EVMs. And the first one to raise this was uh, uh, L.K. Advani. In 2009, he said that Congress is winning all the elections because of the rigging of the EVMs. And then it was taken up by other parties. So what we have seen is that whoever, whichever party is in the opposition, it becomes vocal about uh, the electronic voting machines. But, you know, continuously, uh, the high court, the Supreme Courts, the, the, the cases have gone, uh, you know, they have, the, the, there has been litigation on that. And this litigation, when it has sort of the verdicts have been given, it, uh, the verdicts are usually uh, with the election commission saying that there are, there are two things which happen. One is uh, malfunctioning of the machines and the completely different cases of tampering. So it's basically the machines are malfunctioning which are changed. But what the election commission has done and has been asked to do is, is to see to it that the, you know, that the, the the public opinion, the people are explained that it comes out clear on this. So many times the election commission has held demonstrations. In fact, in 2017, um, uh, one of the political parties said that we have demonstrated, we have seen, we have experimented and we have seen that they can be tampered with the uh, machines. So um, then the, you know, immediately the election commission came out and issued a statement and they investigated the case and they found that that was not a real machine on which this experiment was done, but it was a dummy machine. And so no conclusive evidence has come. It might come, but it, it sort of, it sort of, it's upon the election commission to keep explaining to people, keep, keep demonstrating that the, these ballot units and the control units are not you know, are not connected to the internet or to the Bluetooth or some cloud network. They are standalone machines. But still people have suspicions that, you know, there's something which is not right and the election commission has to answer for it. And this is why the VVPAT ma uh, machines were also introduced uh, in, in the elections earlier. In 2019, it was seen that their uh, use has been... Uh, universalized and there were questions on that too but there has been no sort of evidence to show that there's a tampering which has gone on of course it one has to wait for about seven seconds to see the, the name the name uh, uh, of the uh, the symbol uh, and the name of the candidate uh, for which one has voted on that small screen which comes in that uh, voter verifiable uh, audit paper trail so uh, these are things which you know that constantly when there's a criticism it has to be sort of explained it has to the, the election commission has to because you know it is a people's forum it is a people's institution so it has to come out and explain and uh, see to it that suspicions are uh, you know are um, calmly dealt with and uh, it comes out clean on uh, you know whatever uh, questions are, are raised um, of course, we are living in a very, very different world now, the world in the 90s and the decades of the 2000s, very different world to what, um, you know, we are now. In fact, if we just see in terms of technologies, uh, in 1995, uh, people using the internet were just 0.026%, and in 2022, the figures were 43%. So, and we are living in a world of fake news, we are living in a world of so much of misinformation, also, we are living in a world where there's a growing middle class. The middle class, they say, is about 30% now, very well connected, very well, uh, you know, uh, sort of set in a uh, technologically modernized world. And two, two thirds of a population is less than 35 years, which means that more and more people are going to come and become enfranchised they'll be eligible to vote and the election commission has to uh, see to it that this process of enfranchisement uh, goes ahead of course when the electoral rolls are made elector, uh, electoral rolls are revised there's so much so many complaints which come from various cities that uh, you know so many people have been disenfranchised and we don't find our names in the electoral rolls 
and in fact there was this allegation which came up that you know a significant number of the minority in a particular city had been left out so these are the allegations which the election commission you know gets and it has to be it has to see to it that it remains autonomous it was foreseen as a, a neutral body by the constitution by the constitution makers and it sh should see to it that you know the, of course the appointments are made by the government it, appointments are made by the president on the advice of the government but once the the appointments are made once the election commission uh, comes to be it should see to it that its conduct is impartial and neutral and you know one last thing that uh, about about the appointment of the commission in fact that was also in the news um, uh, recently i mean for the last few months there has been a talk about that also that earlier the appointments of the election commission were made by the government and it was just the the government advises the president and the appointments are made the supreme court said and this is something which was said by several committees also earlier in from the beginning from the 1990s that the the appointment of the commission should be more broad based so that it you know all the possibility even if there's a small possibility of it becoming biased should be eliminated so uh, the supreme court went ahead on that and said that the appointment should be made by a committee consisting of the prime minister the um, chief justice and the leader of the opposition and that has been said by the earlier committees as well that the chief justice of india should be there in the appointing committee but we all know that the government went ahead and went ahead in you know formed a law on the on that that the chief justice uh, was sort of removed and in its place in his or her place uh, the a cabinet minister chosen by the prime minister so you know for us we think that this appointment was democratized by the supreme court and the government took this back and it was a retrograde step but the thing is before the supreme court came into the picture the appointments were already made by the government so now what has happened is that the government the ruling re regime has uh, legalized this which is a sort of a step backwards earlier it was the government now and and the government just made the appointments according to the con the way the constitution there was no parliamentary law on that now there's a parliamentary law and this has become much more concretized it has been become legalized that uh, the the uh, commissioners uh, ele chief election commissioner and the other two commissioners would be appointed by a body uh, consisting of the prime minister the leader of the opposition and uh, a cabinet minister appointed by the prime minister himself or herself so um to end uh, you know institutions i'm coming back to my earlier point that institutions are important they are in themselves political actors formal state institutions uh, they you know they they are reproduced they are the part of the context i mean they are sort of they are born of the context of the times the, and they are products of the situation we are in the political situation we are in but still they have a certain amount of power and autonomy which they should exercise and you know not only just um, uh, you know um, behaving in an impartial conducting themselves in an, in an impartial manner but also seen to be impartial and uh, neutral and push back these are state institutions and democ democracy is an institutional form of government so institutions are important for us and they are the ones who have to push back any sort of authoritarian or democratic uh, 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 charge which comes from the ruling regime and set the logic of appropriateness logic of procedures that they have to be uniform things have to be conducted impartially and uh, you know in a neutral manner so election commission here is very important it carries democracy on its shoulders so its autonomy for us as citizens is something which is very very crucial and important and especially when there are attacks on uh, dissent when there are attacks on uh, people who are on the margins on the minorities uh, attacks on individual freedoms um, etc so uh, with this i end the talk uh, that the autonomy of the institution needs to be asserted thank you thank you manjari uh, the job of the election commission you have said more than once is complex and humongous and vast yeah. 
but i think the job of your job in the last one hour also has been very very complex but you have made it so easy and to be able to and for all i think there are many questions i have a question myself but my question will come later uh, i'll first leave it to the audience i am dr chakravarti a retired civil servant who had the opportunity of uh, associating with at least three elections two of lok sabha and one of the assembly not that that's important but i do have an exposure to that experience i'm going to ask a question which is outside my experience recently um the supreme court came out with the decision on electoral bonds prior to that the supreme court had decided in what is famously known as puttaswami's case in puttaswami's case the right to privacy was declared as a fundamental right that's a puttaswami's judgment that's of 2017 or so in the electoral bonds case that decision was quoted if you see the puttaswami's judgment is 1400 pages long it may take 3 4 days to even to go through the decision now in the electoral bonds case the court said apex court said right to privacy is important but what is important for a voter is right to information right to information includes when a voter goes to the uh, to the booth he should know who has contributed what money to which party and was there a quid pro quo was there anything in reciprocation if that information is not available the voter cannot make an informed decision to vote to whom sorry wants right now the point is the supreme court has set aside the article bonds case on this very plea that the right to information and right to privacy are not transparent in the whole scheme fine no no questions asked the bow to the supreme court on this but what is important is this you have dis- dismissed a whole uh, scheme fine what is alternative you go back to the paper ballot was it better was the paper ballot also had the same kind of a secrecy transformation sorry uh, transparency and all kinds of problems so going back to that scheme is not going to make any difference so if i am not going to be uh, taken out for contempt of court i will make one suggestion the supreme court should have at least said because they have a power under the constitution that in order to do full justice they can do anything they want in terms of what they think is legally deemed fit at least the supreme court could have said all right with this uh, electoral bond scheme gone out this will be the two three things which you should take care of transparency the equity and then the incorruptibility of the system and all that and then do the whatever you want new law have a scheme instead of doing that they left it back to the government where there's nothing now no scheme only ballot paper so that's one thing which i want to ask you or your take on it on a small point here the constitution of the election commission which was a major point here the very many tribunals have the same system chief the the uh, prime minister the uh, leader of the opposition and the chief justice or his nominee that's the thing in number of tribunals that could have been adopted for this but i don't know why in this scheme they said that there will be another member who will be appointed as a cabinet minister by the prime minister will be nominated i think that dilutes this uh, composition of the committee to some extent so i would like to your take on these two points thank you uh, yes you are right i mean this is uh, you know this is the thing but that it uh, dilutes uh, uh, you know the the independence the autonomy of the commission and uh, uh, in fact uh, i i am remembering uh, there was this suggestion by one of the former uh, chief election commissioners bb tandon that the body to appoint the election uh, commissioners should be a seven member strong committee so i mean various suggestions have come that the election commission for its autonomy for more independence to conduct its work in a more uh, neutral way should be appointed by a body which is broad based and this definition of broad based has changed and uh, you know the the parliamentary law now sort of makes it clear what has happened uh, about that so yeah your point is well taken um about your earlier question about poll bonds uh, 
uh, yes, the Supreme Court sa said that this is unconstitutional, this is sort of violates the right to information of uh, uh, voters, it is arbitrary. So this is something which we have to strike down and it asked the State Bank of India actually to furnish all information of the donors, of amounts and etc. which parties to the election commission by 6th of March, uh, which the State Bank hasn't done. It has asked for more time, a few months in fact. And uh, critics are saying that maybe it's because, uh, you know, the, election, the, the State Bank doesn't want to bring this out because the elections are around the corner and it might embarrass the ruling party. Of course. Uh, on that I have a follow-up yeah. question. The government enacted a law for electoral bonds. The government in its law guaranteed anonymity. Yes. And the Supreme Court strikes down the law. But isn't the right of privacy infringed by this concept, by, by, by this decision? Because they, believing the government that it uh, that their privacy will not be invaded, yeah, believing yeah. the government that the anonymity is guaranteed, there would have been people who have contributed. I, I know it's not true, but anyway, yeah, I'm talking yeah, law. Yes. So how is it that we'll reconcile ourselves that when a law is enacted, Supreme Court is saying that the citizens' right of privacy should be compromised? Yeah. I mean, what the uh, Sup uh, Supreme Court has said here, I mean, it has prioritized uh, right to information, number one. And it also has said, in fact, it has given this statement as well in its verdict that, I mean, this sort of a thing acts like a quid pro quo, as uh, Sir said. And uh, it strengthens the nexus between uh, big corporations and political parties where uh, the ordinary voters uh, suffer. So it has prioritized right to information. Of course, yeah, right to privacy is something which is, uh, you know, a constitutional thing. But uh, but it has also called this unconstitutional. It has said that in its verdict. Um, and they say the right to information, which is something which was um, enacted uh, in 2002 about uh, the citizens' right to know about, uh, you know, about the education qualification, criminal antecedents, and... Uh, uh, the wealth of contestants. So the Supreme Court has sort of gone with that interpretation and on, on that. The yeah. percentage is uh, around 55 to 60 percent. Uh, how do you, f what do you think to increase this voting percentage? Percentage because almost 40 percent of the people don't vote. So don't you feel that the government should make this as an offence or they can punish the people who don't come and vote? You know, we see that in India, voting percentages were quite low when we started the elections, the first elections in 1951-52, uh, when they happened. The, vote, uh, the Lok Sabha uh, 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 electoral uh, count was voter participation was just 45 percent. And today it is 67. Last elections it was 67 percent. So what we see in that in general elections, the, the voting par participation, the voter participation is rising, which is contrary to, uh, you know, very different to many uh, industrialized democratic countries where the voting percentage is falling. So it, this has been debated that uh, whether we should go in for compulsory voting, but then, uh, you know, the legal luminaries, the academics and other, you know, policy makers feel that in India, where the voting percentage is rising, there's no need for compulsory voting. And if you go for the, you, if you see the state assembly elections, there the voter participation is even higher. Some states very, very high. Like it goes into 80% or something like that, and 70% is considered low. So we don't need a law like that. That's what has been felt because the voter percentage is rising. Yeah. I made a research on election reforms. If you cancel the electoral bonds, how the parties can get the funds? Are you indirectly allowing them to go for corruption? Electoral bonds. Yes, when we are giving information to income tax, these, these, they have to give the information to the income tax or any other department. Number one, that is, that is one. And number two is not related to speech. But can we make, we are only following simple majority. Can we make the parliament says 75 percent should come for a ruling party or 75 percent of the voters for the ruling party. Is it 
gives any effect on our, our democracy. Thank you. We remember came only in 2017. I mean, you mean to say that the election process wasn't going on, parties weren't getting money? No. Companies were giving money and it's, you know, like they can contribute. It's just that if the contribution is more than 20,000, uh, it has to be reported to the election commission. But if it's below 20,000, there's no need to report. It's an, it can be an unknown, unknown source. It's legal. So, you know, everybody has don don donated so far. Legal bonds came <coughs> only in 2017. My question was, uh, you southern and western states have more um, flow of money and distribution of money compared to the north and the east. So I wanted to ask you, um, how do you think this non-uniform distribution of money uh, impacts the general atmosphere of an election? Distribution of money, uh, they are not contemporary. There are very, very advanced techniques. I can't <laughs> say that on stage. I have, a, I have an inside the ring view of how it is being done. So many things, you know, we, we know of, but uh, yeah, certain things, you know, uh, cannot be discussed and we all know about them. So that's okay. Yeah, you know, it's about the money which is caught by the flying squads, by the financial agencies which work under the election commission. And from the amount which is caught during every election, uh, the, the estimates are made and that show uh, that the South Indian states, the South and the West are the regions where the money flow is, is there. Money flow might also be there uh, in other places, in, in the other regions, but the calculations have been made on the amount of money which, is, which gets caught, which is illegal money. So that's how we get to know uh, that uh, this is what is, you know, getting reported and getting, the figures are coming out. Social activist. Election commission through RTI has given an information that the E in EVMs, the microcontrollers are used are not one-time programmable. If they are not one-time programmable, they can be erased before elections or at the time of elections or after elections. Many nations all over the world, even the developed nations are using ballot system. Many times after elections, these people are talking about EVMs. Why they are not banning? And after 45, from 45 days, in the Jantar Mantar, they are doing dharna. In that Supreme Court, advocates are participating. So elections are not going fairly according to me from past 20 years. So there is no people day by day, many, most of half of the Indians are not at all, uh, uh, they are not on uh, EVMs. So to save democracy in India, there is no democracy. To save democracy, EVM should be banned. What do you say on this? Most of the allegations have come from the opposition parties. Once they are start ruling, the allegations stop. Uh, number two, um, you know, that, there's one example I, I came up with, uh, you know, I was, when I was explaining the context of uh, the working of the election commission was the Chandigarh mayoral uh, election where the ballot papers were defaced. So, you know, ballot paper on their own don't guarantee something which is, you know, that it will be completely foolproof. So, you know, that, that's an example before us. And whenever we saw the rigging has happened, ballot papers have been defaced time and again. But I go along with you. I feel that whenever there's a doubt, there's a suspicion, the election commission should uh, address these doubts and answer them. And so far, I as a researcher haven't seen, uh, you know, I've seen, you know, machines, I've read about machines which have malfunctioned, but tampering is something which has to be, which has so far not been proven. That's what at least I have, what I have seen from, uh, what I have read about and what my information is when I spoke to some of the election commissioners. I mean, they are standalone machines. They are not connected to any cloud network or internet network. What is your, I mean, Mr. Ashok Lavasa, yes. dissent, what yes. happened? And uh, I mean, I just know what you know that, uh, you know, that when the regime or the prime minister or his party does something which vi is violative of the mo model code of conduct, the, you know, the allegation is that the election commission is soft on that. It doesn't take steps. And 
you know lavasa what we know about it that he went he sort of he he gave a dissenting note and there was some difference within the election commission of that time and that's why these allegations came that somehow the election commission is not following a neutral path it is going soft on the ruling party yes that that what you said is right yeah uh, good evening madam i am sudha karudu people feel that when they go to voting booth yeah their what their names are missing so why don't you have a permanent election commissioner enrollment process or sometimes people in hyderabad are having a what people in andhra <laughs> some guntur or narsapur or vaizag they are having what how to eliminate this duplicity second question is why not we introduce now that election the electoral system has stabilized in india why not we introduce a proportional representation system very elaborate and detailed and brief on election commission activities since 1940 till date uh, a follow up on uh, the percentage of vote i'll give an legal example of mca company law they have resolution like special resolution who were participated total votes of that percentage 75% should be there if you are winning something like that you can do not on the vote count of one or two extra or winning candidate already lies there in company law as a special resolution just second is uh, i'm i'm just watching for the past 5 years that elections of a state level is announced and prime minister comes with thousands and thousands of schemes as if he is donating or inaugurating or contributing just before election and road show goes on same way same way now for the parliament election is due and he is going every state announcing thousands and thousands of crores what is the link between just announcing before the election it is a 5 years tenure or 10 years tenure he had he could have gone now he is announcing all this thing it is not something unexpected from a prime minister who is uh, heading the chair of the nation i mean you answered it yourself that this is what is happening and we see it you know during every election and uh, that's that's you know that's another reason why allegations come that the election commission is soft on the ruling party that it you know it one of the things was that it, it's about the schedule that after all the announcements are done then you make the schedule why is that so one of the one of the allegations was that that this you know this shows that you're going soft you're not taking any steps against the regime or the party and uh, the other thing is that also the use of official machinery that uh, the executive going about using official machinery and the model code of conduct is in operation in fact it's not now but that was uh, what was seen during the 2019 is, uh, elections that the model code of conduct is in force uh, but uh, the regime is using uh, going about you know um, canvassing to various states and this is and it's going very soft it, there's no action which is taken there's no censure which is issued there's no warning which is issued which is so readily issued for the opposition candidates opposition parties so these were the very real allegations which came up during the 2019 elections and some of them were also there uh, during 2014 and also the whole thing which was reported very broadly i mean very very sort of in detail the politicization of pulwama and bala court that why is that happening why is that politicization and votes are being asked in that name and that allegation was very strong that the election commission should do something about it which is not being done you know you said uh, the each of the Uh, contestant he has got an upper limit and all that thing. he is supposed to declare it so just a little bit of correction whatever he is dishing out the money he or she dishing out the money that is not part of the expenditure obviously yeah, yeah. and you said rightly the uh, voter is very happy to receive the money from all the parties and then that is in no way mm. not necessarily actually not necessarily affecting his voting uh, preference okay but one thing is sure if no money is distributed that chap is not going to get the vote if a political contestant he is not dishing out the money there are some people who are by virtue of their uh, strong beliefs they don't dish out the money but you can be rest assured that he is not getting the votes okay that's the reason why the political parties have an incentive to dish out the money and it is a race 
who dishes out more and all that thing. It some way or the other it affects. Okay, that's one point. The second point, your views on that. The second point is uh, you know uh, the electoral bonds kind of thing. Enough has been discussed, but I have one simple analogy kind of thing. In PMLA, I think there is something called proceeds of the criminal activity. It is not a criminal activity in the electoral bonds to get the money because it's a legally this thing. Now, after five years or seven years, Supreme Court has come out with the ruling that it is unconstitutional. Now, similarly, in this case, the proceeds of the unconstitutional activity, what is the effect on these people who have got elected, who have ruled for, say, for example, this thing? Is there a, is there a particular person or a particular party, depending upon their thing, those people cannot contest ahead or? something of that nature. Things have to come out. We don't know the SBI has been asked for information, information to be given to the election commission. We don't know what is that. And, you know, it, it's, it's sort of, it seems, and that is what has been alleged, that uh, time has been asked because election, uh, the, the elections are around the corner and, uh, you know, to save the ruling party from embarrassment, of course, yeah. Recently, Fali Narimanji passed away, and I was seeing the old interviews. In one of those interviews, uh, the um, S.Y. Qureshi was in the audience. He was asking Fali Narimanji, like, uh, in this, this particular, any CEC who takes position, he does not even have to take an oath, like an MP or like, and mostly it's a nominated post, as you told us. So, um, he's, he expressed his surprise that how come the chief election commissioner himself, um, the former, uh, he expressed himself saying that uh, how come it's everything happening so smoothly uh, and he, um, he wondered, I mean, can you please tell us, um, uh, is it just by an accident or a coincidence of having good people at the top place or how does, what kind of precautions can be taken to make sure that um, in future also there will be a good number, a good high integrity oriented people will join into that, um, that stage. That's room number. That's question number one. Sorry, um, one more question. See, uh, you were all explaining us about uh, how much amount of resources, financial, human resources, goes into one particular election. Um, that means just the Lok Sabha elections. If this all elections happens together from the down panchayat level to the topmost level, including Raj Sabha, Lok Sabha, and all those things, if happen at one level, uh, then is it actually possible, or uh, is it doable, or is just uh, it takes it? Uh, does it does it have another three four years to go about it? See, in in this line, three four decades or three four gen elections will happen before we can have one month one election, whatever it is, one election, one nation. And um, related to this question is that Kanshiram said that the more the elections happen, the better it is for those people who are at the margins of the society. Because he, this party is also crucial in Indian scheme of elections. So, and at one level we are saying that uh, there is resources too much of involved. Where do you think is, uh, what do you think about it? I Thanks. mean the government as I said is, is very serious. It seems that it's very serious on the, uh, the one nation, one election uh, uh, matter. Uh, and you know, from reports, I don't know what the inside story is. How would I know that? But from reports, it seems that they are looking at the 2029 elections, where you know they want some everything synchronized, and uh, they have uh, you know like if if there are it's it either means cutting short the terms of assemblies or you know prolonging them, but all those nitty gritties have to be worked out. Uh, you know, by the you know election commission, the law commission, uh, you know, uh, the governments, the political parties, all, and the, of course the higher level committee which is there. So we don't know much about it, how things are going to happen and what's going. But it seems that the government wants to go ahead. That, that uh, conducting elections, it's very elaborate and it takes a lot of money also. I just want to know the rationale behind. Uh, Allowing a person to con uh, uh, contest from two po po places at a time. I mean, what is the rational why? I mean, this is, I mean, uh, my question might be a bit outside the discussion, but I just want to know. Into the mic. I just want, what is the rational behind uh, allowing a person to contest from uh, two places in one election and when it is very costly procedure? Ma why do they allow? Like, if at all a person uh, wins in both the places, he gives up one place. Of course, of course, a lot of money is involved, and election is a very uh, costly yes. process. It's a very, very expensive, uh, uh, you know, um, 
uh, event and uh, one sees that not everybody is doing it it's only some a uh, very few uh, you know uh, leaders and everybody and the high profile ones because it's it's very expensive not everybody does it it's, it happens in a very few cases and the rationale everybody knows why it happens and it, there is it's something which is within the you know uh, legally permissible um, act so they just go ahead but very very few do it i i i must say a piece of wisdom which i got from a lady who's now a minister in this cabinet i walked with her in the bharat jodo yatra and she said how come you cannot drive if you are drunk there is a penalty for a drunken driving why don't they have a penalty for drunken voting <laughs> and why don't they have breathalyzers along with the evms and disenfranchise voters if they are drunk and she also said that at least save us one day of expenditure the historical uh, you know are talking about the doctor session to current system i was just wondering imagine session would have been alive and he would have been the continued the election commission what could be his role in current time especially i believe that he was a very lucky ec because he was dealing with the political party and the politician okay and i believe that the current time is very very different so do you think i understand he was a very courageous person uh, he was he has very de determined person but i'm just wondering will he able to play the similar role in the current time do you uh, so i just want to hear your views on that what would be the situation and now uh, you know if he had still been the commissioner and of course it's something which is you know like uh, to sort of defang him Uh, the commission was made more broad based and you know two other additional commissioners were appointed so and it was said it was you know like it was made very clear legally that uh, if the you know the decision decision of the commission is not unanimous it's uh, they they go by majority uh, decision so uh, that's what i mean it, he, look it's not that his word would be carried you know all the time there are two others who have to decide along with him so we don't know because earlier when he was there as a election commissioner he was the sole person sole official there and he could sort of take it ahead but here more broad based ec i mean he could be sort of you know outvoted by the others a judge uh, taking resignation voluntarily and also mentioning that this party has been in touch with me i'm talking about the recent incident do you think there should be a cooling period for civil servants judges for about 2 years that they don't contest any election something which has come up it comes up every now and then that what should be you know post retirement you know of officials uh, you know uh, what should be there in the terms of service whether they sort of you know about the whole thing about as you said employment about joining a political party or becoming a campaigner or whatever and this is something it's not a new question it keeps coming up and whether to sort of uh, completely do away with it you know post retirement or have a cooling period it's something which i mean it keeps coming up of course there has to be something uh, you know um, you know whether you are in the judiciary or in the election commission or something which is uh, you know in the bureaucracy uh, generally what does it do i mean you know it's it's you know it shows that it sort of what to what extent uh, politicization politicization in a way is good but we it's sort of it, here it's something which is becoming a little sort of uh, which sort of going going against what we say are democratic and ethical norms and this is something which is not a new question which we we have you know we have seen this coming up again and again yeah uh, my question is actually about uh, something that was pointed out earlier it was about the technology of elections and which is the electronic voting machine and what i have read in the newspapers and other sources i'm not i'm not a researcher in this area is that this machine obviously it's a machine it has both hardware and software and the software of this machine obviously should be of interest to everybody especially the people because this is a software that's really marking our votes and is literally carrying all the votes that we have in some sense uh, apparently this software is not disclosed it is not open source in other words okay and i just wanted to know um, you know your thoughts on uh, and also some information if you might have talking to all these people involved in the electoral process 
about what the current or latest position is about this idea of making our so the the technology uh, available and sort of audit that technology in a in a way that uh, very advanced pieces of software today are audited mostly by people. Thank you. Doubts, I think they have to be assuaged. And uh, as you said, you know, the one part is software, the other part is hardware. And, uh, you know, if there's so much of talk about it and, you know, doubts expressed, uh, then the sort of a, a sort of a re very reasonable way is to show, I mean, to sort of assuage those doubts that this is something which is being used and this is the way it, it works. Uh, but you know, then the, the sort of, I don't, I'm not holding, again, I, I'm saying this, that I'm no, not holding a brief for the election commission, but you know, this is something which has not been able to, you know, people who have come up with the allegations have not been able to demonstrate. And that's what the election commission uh, rationale and argument is that, you know, show us what is wrong. You know, we have not seen anything which is, you know, so you have to come up with it. But then I, again, I say that if there are doubts, you know, it has to take steps to see to it that those uh, doubts are arrested and resolved. Menon's uh, financed separation of Pakistan. They were, they wanted separation. 20 industrialists in Germany, they financed Hitler's movement. And uh, uh, our Tata, uh, great Tata ji, donated 8 crores for quitting the movement. So every movement, the businessman will contribute. Now what will happen if all that money which is there with electoral bond is kept with Supreme Court and they should say whoever want to donate for any particular party, donate openly because they have a right. They will say, we expect this party to do well for the nation. So they can donate and people, we have the right to vote for whomever we want even if they are paid by the political parties. Is there a possibility of uh, uh, taking this money and keeping with the Supreme Court? And there is very short period. Donate, there are certain rules which are there about uh, how the companies can donate and uh, what is the amount, there's a cap on the amount where uh, those have, the, the pol political parties have to be open about those do uh, donations. But various suggestions have come about, uh, you know, that they whether we go about in this way, whether, you know, how, do the par how, how much can the parties donate, where do they donate, whether the state should donate, the state should, the, the, the election should be state funded. I mean, these suggestions have also come that, you know, of course, the, the, there's a partial state help which comes uh, to all polit political parties even now that they have, you know, certain time, you know, when the only Doordarshan was there, they, all parties got a certain time, then they got certain platforms and things like that, that things have been made available, all the electoral roles are given to political parties from, you know, so certain uh, state supplements are there already, but do we go for a complete state funding, you know, those suggestions have also come, whether it should be complete or it should be partial, whether, you know, what should we, what should we do about the bonds, what should we do about companies donating, how much should be, you know, uh, sort of revealed, uh, you know, and sort of, uh, it shouldn't stay unknown. So all those suggestions and possibilities are there and certain things are there which the whole election process, the whole election machinery works with that legality. Uh, but of course, possibilities are there and suggestions. Yeah, I think instead of wasting our time on debating on EVMs, now it is only two months around for elections. It is impossible to change that. So instead of going ahead and see how election commission can help us and the smooth process of it. In two months, we cannot change anything, correct? I know, it's, I'm, I'm not an election commission official. I mean, if it's, it's you know, it, uh, that was that was more of your opinion rather than a question. So I don't know what to say to that. I don't have an answer. Thank you, thank you, Manjari, for a wonderful Q and A session and a wonderful speech as such. We will really cherish. This is one of the finest months we have had in the recent times. Thank you very much for that.